This is Julia Whittup with Talk Story TV, and we have with us this morning Norm Wilson, and he's going to be talking to us about how he became a shaman, how he was called to that, and what the process was. So tell us about that, Norm. Thank you very much, Julia, for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, I would like your listeners to go back with me to 1940, if any of them are old enough to do that. And as a little boy, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, Hopalong Cassidy, uh, oh, Lone Ranger and Tonto, a whole bunch of those people. Cowboy movies, cowboys and Indians. And so you were filled with that wonderful storyline and so you can imagine as a seven-year-old when you met a real Indian what it would be like uh-huh you know what a thrill uh, and it was and that's when I met my first uh, they weren't Native American they were first people of Canada uh, they were a part of the Mi'kmaq nation which migrated from Maine to Quebec province uh, in Canada and it, my parents had gone to this place in 1939, and I went in 1940, and I was seven years old. And we lived in a log cabin, one room, with a dirt floor, and in the center that was a pot belly stove with no legs. Now, where were our beds? Our beds were pieces of wood, tree wood, driven into the ground with either elk hide or deer hide stretched, and that was our mattress. Wow. Yeah, no inside plumbing, mm -hmm. no running water, of course, and no toilet facilities. We had one window, and that had just gauze over it. And then I had a door that closed over the window so the, the animals couldn't get in at night. <laughs> and there were wolves and bear, uh, elk, uh, moose running all over the place. It was totally wild. Probably maybe not quite a half a mile away were three wigwams or teepees. And that's where the Indian here lived when I first met her. Uh, there was always a protocol that you followed when you call on someone to visit them. Mm -hmm. And there was two women and three men. And I, I never connected the relationship between them at that age. So anyway, um, my mother and I had gone to pay our respect, and there was a pot, big pot boiling something. Oh, it smelled just awful, Julia. The most awful smell in the world. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. And so uh, my mother gave her a little gift and vice versa. So she suddenly reached over and picked up this humongous knife. Now I'm probably weighing in at 45, 50 pounds. So Right. The knife was big. And reached over and went, picked up a piece of something off the floor. And I thought she was going to cut me up and put me in front of that pot. I <laughs> thought that was going to happen. Well, she handed me what she did. She carved out something. And it was a woman's leg. And she said to me, much to my mother's askance, my mother would not approve of that. Was, well, you don't appreciate this now, but later you will. And of course I did. <laughs> so, that kind of thing. So anyway, there were no children there, so I was sort of uh, a uh, thing of interest also to these people. The one thing about the Micmacs, their healers often did not live with the tribe. They lived separate from the tribe. And they went into the tribe when there was a need, special ceremony uh, for the good hunt or for an illness or a, a wedding, or they would go to get a, a husband or a wife. And we forget that healers were not all men. They were many times women, just as women were chiefs of Native American tribes. So it was not, you know, as it is sometimes today's world. Anyway, uh, my parents would go fishing all day, and, and a seven-year-old, you got bored sitting in a little boat. And the Baskerton Reserve was a man-made lake of 450 miles created in the 1920s to stop the flooding in Quebec City. 
And, and also, you have to understand, there were no paved roads. We right. went over animal trials, you know, hoping the car wouldn't cave in, uh, that kind of thing. And so you, you did that, and so there were no other people around. And I would stay, not go out with my parents fishing. And uh, we were there for the whole summer. We spent the summer there every year for 14 years. And so I would have my books with me and a couple of toys. And I would go wandering wherever I felt like, totally oblivious to the wild animals. Just That's wondering. how my childhood was too. Yeah, you know, well, I know you were into this yourself. So you just had that innocence, if you want to call it that. Anyway, so um, Eliza Pye, that's what I called her, uh, the healer, took a liking to me and began to show me little things. Like, well, you don't touch that, that's a nettle, unless you need nettle tea, and you get them young. Well, that's really a, a wild potato, so you can eat that, and that's a carrot. You don't eat that when it looks like it, but it's poison. So we began to do those kinds of things, and I just would hang around with her. And she eventually began to show me more and more, like uh, if you ran out of toilet paper, which fern you should use. <laughs> and sometimes that was... <laughs> sure better not be poison ivy, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you learned that very quickly. <laughs> so anyway, that relationship developed. And as I spent more and more time there, she used to begin to call me uh, a name that I thought that was my name, she was calling me. And the knickknack uh, was she was calling me healer. Wow. And I wasn't aware of that at that moment in time, but I did later. So anyway, what happened was that um, she gave me a bow and arrow, made me a little boat, a basket for gathering out of birch bark for gathering food edibles and for medicine. And part of the ceremony to do me, if you want to call it that, was she took the bow and arrow and killed a bird with it. I think it may have been a partridge, could have been a ringneck, a pheasant, dipped it in the blood, and the arrow in the blood, and she's that so that it always aimed true. And she took that blood then and put it on my forehead, and went back into the teepee camp area, wigwams. And it was then that she said, okay, we're going to do a little ceremony. I thought, oh, this was wonderful, seven-year-old. What an adventure. <laughs> you know, not cognizant of really what was going on at that point. So she said, I'm going to cut you. And I still have a scar here. Scar. You can it from the cut. Holding my hand over a fire, letting the blood drip down into it. And I wasn't frightened of it. And then she took a a leaf of something and it stopped bleeding immediately. But when she did that, she also went like that into the fire and it burst up. So I'm suspecting she put some maybe cedar chip or a little powder in there that she'd ground up to make it flare up. Very impressive. Mm. And, oh, wow, <laughs> I'm being initiated into something. I have strong blood. <laughs> 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 Look what it's doing to the fire. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine a seven-year-old, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just <laughs> how this was going on. And so it became a game with us of what we would do. And you might ask, say, well, where are my parents during all this time? They were out fishing in the lake, and I had my own little rowboat, and I could row out to what I called a snow-capped mountain. But it turned out it wasn't really snow, it was clear quartz white quartz. Wow. It was just gorgeous. I would spend hours there just wandering around. So anyway, she said, okay, we need to have a little ceremony. So anyway, that was beginning then the ceremony for my vision quest. And I have a picture of me sitting on this rock out on the water. It wasn't taken during my vision quest because my parents didn't know I was out there. I snuck out at night. <laughs> And you, this is strange because you could hear the wolves running around the camp at night or the bear rubbing their backs up against the log, logs, scratching their backs. And I was out there totally unafraid. It didn't occur to me that they would hurt me. It didn't occur to me there was anything bad. Right. So going to the woods, uh, probably a mile and a half into the woods, get our drinking water. 
alone, bring it back, slapping it all the way back to the kingdom. <laughs> so anyway, I was to go on top of this rock and I would sneak out after night. Now, it got dark early in this part of the country up there. So I would sneak out and go and get on this rock and spend the night there. And then just get back in before dawn, I almost got caught once with my mother. She wanted to know what I was doing. I said, well, I had to go to the outhouse. So I, I got out of it that way, but anyway, that's <laughs> true. And during one of the nights, I spent three nights like that out there. Uh, I heard the wolves running around and I thought, well, they can't get me there. I'm in the water, the tide has come in, you know what I mean? Anyway, I sort of realized there was something out there and, and I took a closer look and there was a humongous head looking at me. There was a giant cinnamon bear, brown bear. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to eat me. And it opened its mouth like this at me and I realized, no, it wasn't going to hurt me. It was there letting me know that it knew that I was there. And I, I guess I felt there was a friendship between that bear and myself. And you know, that's how you pick up a spirit guide. Yes, yeah, so you that- You know that very well. Yes. So, uh, so bear became a good friend, not an enemy. And I would go out picking blueberries, huckleberries, and I learned very quickly that not all blueberries were edible. You know? <laughs> uh, but I wasn't afraid to do that. So that became that. And during my so-called vision quest, now, I want to make a point here. A vision quest is not necessary for you to be a healer. Right. It's to get your spirit guides, your animal guides, okay, to find out what it is that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a revelation, but it isn't necessary to be a healer. Everybody could be a healer, Julia, if they would just get rid of all the garbage they've had piled on them all their life. Mm -hmm. You know that as well as I do. Uh, so anyway, that was that experience, and I, I lived that. And every summer I would learn something new about what to do. Uh, for example, uh, how to write yourself up in a canoe. Now I'm on the water and I don't know how to swim. I didn't know how to swim until years after I was an adult. Wow. I was a dog paddle. But I was never afraid of the water. I had a life jacket on, you know, that kind of thing. I never had a close call with an animal that was bad. It never frightened me in any way from that point of view. But one summer when we went back, she was not there anymore. And I was heartbroken. And I never knew what ever became of her. And as I understand now as an adult, she moved on. I don't know whether she passed away or whether she moved with the tribe, you know, to another location. Mm -hmm. There was no way for me to find that out. Uh, with us. So that was really the beginning of my initiation, if you want to call it that, of being selected, being chosen mm -hmm. to be a healer. And I never really talked a lot about this because people, you know, would make fun of you if you did strange things. <laughs> you, know? you know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, I had, um, I knew things were going to happen before they happened. Uh, and I can give you uh, an example. Uh, the roads, as I told you, were dirt roads, messy things. And uh, my mother had gotten in the back seat to take a nap because we were on the road for hours to get back where we were going. And I was in the front seat and I said to my father, there's a car going to come around and hit us. So I laid down and it did. It's caved the front end of the car. And I was knocked up onto the dashboard. Now we're talking a 1940 car, you know, they're stick shifts kind of thing. Yeah. So, but I wasn't really badly hurt. So uh, those kinds of things, if you told people about them, they would say you were weird. You know, you were queer, not as the word today means a sexual connotation. Right. Out of your skull. Uh, so that you learn to keep your mouth shut. Uh, did you have an a imaginary friend when you were little? Um. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And but you kept, it wasn't really an imaginary friend, it was real. Yeah, <laughs> I had an imaginary horse. <laughs> yeah, so you know, whatever it was, it was very real. Uh, I can uh, tell you about a, 
a near-death experience, if you want to call it that. Oh, yeah. Look, I'd like to hear that story. Okay. Uh, one summer after we had spent the summer there, my father had to go into New York City. He had a meeting uh, at the Stork Club. Remember the Stork Club? You ever hear about that? Heard one? of it. The famous clubs in New York. Mm -hmm. This may have been, I don't know, the late 40s. And uh, I went along, and in those days, you could open the windows on a train. They weren't air conditioned. You could do what? You could open the windows on the train. They were not air conditioned trains. Oh, right. Okay. And I remember seeing a big sign outside of uh, one of the big fancy stores in New York. Uh, uh, Cooled air. They didn't call it <laughs> air conditioned. <laughs> they didn't call it air conditioned. No, cool air. So this was really fun. Anyway, uh, I breathed in and I got all of the burning stuff along the track and it turned out poison ivy and I inhaled that. <gasps> so I became a mess. Two doctors in New York City didn't do anything for me. So my parents wrapped me up bare butt naked in a sheet and took me back home on the train. And there our family doctor came to the house. The only thing they had to treat you in those days was um, sulfur. You know, they didn't have penicillin and all that. If they did have, but it was reserved for the military. Right. Uh, so anyway, I was delirious. I was just not eating and nothing. Well, my mother came into my bedroom one time and I said, do you see all those people outside the window? And they were beautiful, tall, they were angelic, but they weren't angels. They were more like Elbills out of C.S. Lewis, <laughs> uh, you know, his books. And she said, oh, you're hallucinating. And I'm saying to myself, if I'm hallucinating, how do I know she's telling me that? It was real. So I said, okay, I'm hungry. She said, you what? So she said, well, I'll get you some soup. When she left, they smiled at me and they were beautiful and the sky was just sort of a gorgeous rose and this is broad daylight. And I'm looking out my bedroom and this giant bird came up right to the window and it said, you're chosen. Wow. Now I didn't know what that bird was until later when it was a bald eagle. Wow. Uh -huh became my second spirit guide, if you will. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, how wonderful. Yeah. So I wrote about these things in my novels, changing the location, changing names, uh -oh. um, to protect myself, if you will. And I said, okay, in my 80s, who gives a crap what people think? <laughs> No, I finally got to that point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Whether they think I'm. So I, I, I decided that I, I was a teacher, a college professor for years. And after 40 years, I quit. I resigned, I retired. But there was something else I needed to do. So I went and became trained as a, a Reiki master. Mm -hmm. And I became a third level with extended uh, certificates and very special. So I could teach people healing. And I began to do little things like that to heal. And then I went ahead and said, okay, I can blend that with what I know about herbs and stuff to heal people. Okay, how you use the drum. So I'll talk about that kind of a thing in just a second. So I said, okay, we can do that. So then I went on and, and got certified as a crystal healer. <laughs> so I, I'm combining all that. So I'm now offering uh, shamanic healing publicly and I have a place in, in town where I from where I live. But one of the things that we, we forget if if we would stop and concentrate and we could all do healing work. As you well know, uh, you can do that. I put that together. So then I decided, okay, let's write some nonfiction books that explain some of these things so people have an idea. Because the yes. new word now is alternative medicines and I don't like that. I like supportive medicine uh, integrative medicine, complementary medicine. Uh -huh. If you're saying alternative to your doctor, you're insulting them. You know, like, well, there's something better than you. Because so we I, should be the first choice. Yeah, so I, I prefer to have supportive medicine. So my first book, I said, okay, I need to explain what shamanism is and what a shaman does. Mm -hmm. And that was called Shamanism, What It's All About. I don't know whether you can see that very well there or not. 
Oh, nice. And I noticed it's a little book. And I said, okay, people are on trains, planes, and they're very busy. They don't want a lot of fancy stuff. They want it right to the point. Get to the point. <laughs> so this, each chapter is maybe only a page or two long. Quick okay. read. So that explained then what a shaman did. And then I said, okay, we talk about uh, spirit guides. I said, okay, let's talk about spirit guides. So I came up then with activating your spirit guides. Oh, okay. And that's another little book. Uh-huh. And, and I give the step-by-steps of what a person can do to get in touch with their spirit guide. Well, I hope you'll put links to where you can get those on your profile. I can. I don't, I don't know whether I did or not. Uh, the spirit guide, whatever you want to call it, is real. Okay. And it will tell you, you know, things that you need to know. You're on the right path or you're not on the right path. Uh, you can ask questions of your spirit guide. Spirit guides are also very important to the shaman as a help to find out things to do to help their clients heal. Mm -hmm. They uh, will go to the other world, if you want to call them that, um, to find out answers to the mm -hmm. shaman's questions. And I said other worlds, people call them realms, upper, lower, middle. It has nothing to do with heaven, hell, or purgatory. It's not a religious concept. It's where spirits live. And the upper level is where the uh, teachers live, the ascended masters. And the middle level uh, is where human spirits, they're all human, but human spirits live just outside of our realm. And have you ever been someplace and you felt a little breeze on your cheek? Mm -hmm. Or if you saw somebody was over your look over your shoulder and there's nobody there? Mm -hmm. or a little shadow outside? Yeah. That's just outside of our immediate realm. And if we would just be patient, we could see those and hear them and feel them. The lower realm is not hell. It's where animal spirits live and some human spirits. And they too will help you depending on what your need is. So I go there to ask a question, what do I need to do to help this person? And that's where your spirit guide comes in to help you do that. So then I said, okay, uh, we need to know how to bring about these healings and uh, things. So I wrote us another book, number three, called Shamanic Manifesting. Okay. And, um, manifesting, it was big, you know, the secret, et cetera, the movie, et cetera. Right. I thought, they didn't really tell you the whole story. They left out some stuff. <laughs> yeah. said, let's, let's tell this to the people because it's, it's for them. So this is a little step-by-step -step of how to go ahead and manifest. And I said, okay, we need now to talk about very specific things in what a shaman does to heal. I give talks on shamanic healing. I bring in my drums, the rattles, uh, the crystals, the essential oils, all that. So that's this book, Healing the Shaman's Way. And I very specifically say what a shaman does and why they do it. Okay, now people, and I'm working on one now called Intention, Intention, Failure. Why do our intentions fail? And telling you what to do so they don't fail. And that, uh -huh. book, will, yeah, <laughs> that book will be out uh, the end of the month, I think. Okay. I get concerned because all of these books are manifesting and getting intentions out there primarily deal with getting money. And I'm saying as a healer, let's ask for help in healing. Let's yes. That's good health. You know, and you understand that because you've been through some traumas yourself, you know. Yes. Years. By the way, how's your husband's hand? Oh, it never did get feeling back in his no, finger. Oh, boy. But and he's learning to compensate for that. At least he still has a finger. Yeah. <laughs> That was such a weird, freakish accident. It was. It was very weird. Yeah. Um, but it kind of, we were thinking about, he was thinking about retiring early. And when that happened, he realized, 
we couldn't go three years with no insurance. Yeah. So it might have saved us. Yeah. I know. You don't know what to do, you know, with, with this business of insurance. Okay, so that basically then, uh, we also have to ask, well, are all shaman Native Americans and blah, blah, blah? No, they're from all over the world. Uh, it's, the word shaman just means a, a healer. Yeah. And people think, oh, it's voodoo, you know, witchery. No, it's not. But what we do... And well, I mean, even voodoo is not voodoo like Hollywood. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We've had so much corruption along the way. Right. They're taming, anyway. I use uh, a drum, and I use a flute, and I use a rattle. Now, you are very much knowing that everything is vibrating. Mm -hmm. All energy is created by vibration. So if we got something wrong with this, uh, we say that, you know, there's a blockage there where the vibration is not flowing through the energy through the body the way it should. Old days, they said an evil spirit was in you, was giving you bad trouble, and you need to extract that. Well, what we do is we take the drum, the flute, and the rattle, and play that around the body to change the flow of the energy, the vibration in the body, so it begins to heal. Wow. Okay. I don't physically do the healing. I bring energy to the person so their energy can begin to click in and go ahead and do the healing themselves. Uh, we use herbs, of course, you know, mm. natural medicine, I call them. Uh, I do that a lot. Yeah, we do too. Why do we ever do that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't I know. didn't even take the drug coverage because. I'm not going to take their drugs. I make my own. Yeah, we don't go, go into the prescription drugs. I don't know. Did I ever tell you that Suzanne had cancer? No. Oh, yeah. Well, see, she just had her six-month checkup and no cancer showing up. She Yay. had a very rare form of bone cancer, not in the bone marrow. Like only 3 to 4% of the cancers are this kind of cancer. A year ago, uh, she had a little sore spot on her wrist. And she thought she'd done something in yoga. <laughs> uh -huh. So it turned out to be that she had a theory in her hip. So we went through radiation and chemotherapy. We went through Tibetan bowls. I had a shaman friend come here into the house and do an intensive training, healing on her, Reiki training, healing on her, uh, crystal elixirs, herbs essential oils, everything imaginable we were doing. And she's in good health. It works. She's good now, yeah. yeah it really works. And I'm glad to hear you say that about the business on the drums. So uh, the actual cancer was primary lymphoma of the bone, which was really weird. Yeah. And, and thinking of lymphoma in the bone. You know, so. Anyway, <laughs> we're very grateful. Uh, and the people, I belong to several groups of healers. Uh, one is based in Calcutta, they like 10,000 members. They all started sending healing energy to her. Great, fabulous, and, and she's okay. Yeah, I, said, but, I believe you can do that. And I have oh, about a dozen people I send healing energy to every morning. And you can do that. A shaman did that. And you know, um, here's an awful wall one. You know, we always talk about Native Americans sending up smoke signals. And they were communicating mm -hmm. with smoke signals. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They were sending out. Hmm? They were sending out messages by, through the air. Yes, through their minds. The smoke signal was just tune in. The smoke signal was just to announce that we're going to send you a mental image or we're going to send you a message through our minds. Think about that. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, I've only been able to do it sort of semi-accidentally, not always able to get the message through. Yeah. And that is, I have the same problem. And I've asked a couple of my friends who are shaman. One lived in the Amazon jungle for 11 years and came out. Uh, he said, you're putting too much pressure on to do it. Relax. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you get nervous. You know, I, I had a, a lady that works in a local grocery store here. Her boyfriend had cancer and he had it for 28 years and it came back with a ravage. And I sent healing and I sent him crystals and essential oil, passed away Monday. Well, she said, well, you bought him time. She said, what? You bought him time. Oh. See, so I said, well, okay, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But anyway, we tried. Yeah. I understood that. Well, so, sometimes it's just time. Yeah, and so you accept those things. Um, a shaman doesn't create miracles. He may open the road for miracles to happen, or she may open the road for miracles to happen. Uh, I think that we we get so wrapped up in high technology we forget if what the healers knew in the past, Julia, you and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't successful. Yeah, exactly. Would, the humans would be the people that would be extinct. <laughs> you know? Yep, and so, they wouldn't have kept using a, a, a um, treatment that didn't work. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you're right on with that. Okay. Uh, any questions you'd like to ask me? Now? Wow. So <laughs> many. <laughs> I'm hoping that one, that you will put covers of your book up in the, the slideshow on our website mm -hmm. with links uh, into where to buy them. Okay. They're all available on Amazon, by the way. Okay. So that put the, put the uh, little, descriptions and stuff up so that sure we can maybe that. people can only buy one at a time yeah. and they're going to try to decide which one to start with i'm going do you see this yeah okay i have in that an obsidian uh, it's a black rock and a friend of mine who is a wicca uh-huh uh, carved it in the shape of an arrow oh neat <laughs> and then wrapped it in silver so I can use it as a pendulum. Oh, cool. And I do that. And by the way, I also took classes in being a, a healer with uh, tuning forks. With tuning forks? Mm -hmm. Oh, because you can change the... the tone pitch, sure. Can you see that? That's beautiful. Yeah. There, yeah, maybe that's a little okay, better. Okay, so it's all wrapped in silver. Silver, and then you hang it from that. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, prefer to do that, and I carry that at your little medicine pouch there when I go out of healing uh, with it. Uh, one of the things that a shaman does that's it's very effective, and I, I do this, uh, you, are you familiar with dousing? I've done that. Yes, okay. I thought you had too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I took my dousing rod and I stuck the end of it into a plastic straw uh -huh. so that it moved by itself so people wouldn't think I was doing this. You oh, know, okay. You the frauds. Yeah. <laughs> and so I will do that with a person to find out their, if they're negative energy or positive energy before they're getting healing. How can you tell? Well, if it goes to the left, it's negative. If it goes to the right, it's positive. Okay. And if it goes, like, for example, if you hold it in front of yourself and it goes spinning around like crazy, loaded with energy, good energy. Okay. You can do that with the house, an area. I, so I go into a room, uh, I will do that to see if there's negative energy or positive. If it's negative, then I bring out the smudging. Okay. I, yeah, I use uh, various herbs such as... Uh, Oh, I like my uh, sage to come from California or Montana. Uh, it's what grows wild. I use uh, Palo Santo. You use uh, what? Palo Santo. Uh, you're not familiar with that one? Uh, it's P-A-L-O S-A-N-T-O. Can it you means, write it down in the chat box here? Uh, it means um, holy tree, sacred tree. Right. And you can buy that as an essential oil. 
uh, or as uh, pieces of wood. And I use the wood and the essential oils. It's not as strong as sage when people are offended by this pungent smell. Oh, okay, I'm sage. And I also use uh, uh, cobalt in the mixture, and I light that. I go all the way around the room, and then I come and smudge it over, you know, fan it over a, a person. Uh -huh. the, the energy level, the negative energy, if it's negative, or to build it up, it's positive. If it's positive, I bring it up to the body. If it's negative, I take it down. So you're getting rid of it. Then you can go ahead and begin changing and working on the vibration. Uh, if I'm using my hands, and you know this one, I, I just bring them out. I don't actually have to necessarily touch the person. And if you're going to touch them, I always ask, may I touch you? And I never get personal. Okay. Okay. Uh, primarily two places, the head and the feet. Okay. Okay. The feet are bring up the energy, the natural energy from the earth. All right. I used to go barefoot when we were kids. You know, I loved it. Uh, kind of thing. So it's very good that way. Um, during my talks, I show people little things they can do to help realign their energy for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, pass it on, if you will. You know that I believe in passing it on, and, you know, uh, passing it forward, playing it forward, however the phrase goes, uh, just as you do. Uh, well, anyway, we've done this. Uh, I can give you this, Suzanne just brought this in for me, for Palo Santos, where you can get it. It's out of Oregon, and it's... Is that how you spell it up? Are, yes. Do you have your chat room up? Mm-hmm. Palo Santo, that's how you spell it? Yes. Okay. That's where you get it. Okay. WW. I'll put that in there so you know that. It's not that expensive. It really isn't. You can get the little bundle of little pieces of wood about that size. Uh-huh. Or you can get, you get those from Amazon too. Mm-hmm. You get those from Amazon too. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, you can find this at, at Amazon or you can go to this website. They make it. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, go to their web yeah, they couldn't get it for a while because the, the pale santo tree is not cut down unless it's dead right then they use the wood because it's a holy tree a sacred tree uh-huh and so then they get it and so sometimes it's a little scarce and if they make an essential oil then they go through the whole steaming process and then scoop the oil off okay and it's very nice it's a good purifier it's it's like lavender you know, lavender is a good all-around disinfectant. Yeah. If you have problems, you know, use a, a lavender spray. On, I use a lavender spray on my vegetables and fruit before I clean them. It's really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. That kind of thing. I'm going to tell you one other incident that was a lesson for me. I'm back on the Baskaton Reserve, that's where we were. We called it then the Baskaton Lake. Did you just hear that noise? Yeah. The boss just walked in. She was very <laughs> bossy. She's 20 years old. Your cat? And her, yeah, and her name is Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> and she's lost her hearing. And uh, oh. so she's, she's going to leave now. She says, you're not paying any attention to me. So she's going to go out and bug Suzanne to be brushed. <laughs> I have a cat, too. <laughs> yeah, I know you did. Yes, yeah, so Lucy. So, so we were on the back to town reserve lake, and we came in with my parents from fishing. My dad and I had been out. And I scampered up the bank. And this Indian woman, this first person, First Nation woman of Canada was standing there. Her hair was filthy. And her dress was all covered in mud. And it looked awful. And she was jabbering in something. I didn't understand what in the world she was saying. And my father came up and began to speak to her in French. She was speaking French, oh, okay. French, and I hadn't started French lessons yet. Anyway, uh, the group had gone and left her to die. In the <gasps> oh no! And my father gave her a, a pike, a northern pike. It's a fish, and she began to eat it, guts and all. 
before you could have it cleaned. I thought, oh, I hate them. I just hate all these Indians. They're terrible, they're cruel, and mean. It took me a while to realize that I was using my moral standards on another culture. Yeah. And I had no right to make that judgment. She violated the cultural that she was in by coming out of the woods and not staying there and dying. And it took me a long time to realize that we are so adept to judging other people's traditions negatively mm -hmm. before we find out the history of it. Well, that was a good object lesson for a 12 year old, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I've <laughs> often thought, you know, the only way they could really live in harmony with the land is that that's the way it had to be sometimes. Yeah, and you know, so that isn't that isn't bad. So, and I I realized that uh, the other thing I realized is uh, we went along with with Lassipai. Uh The word squaw was a white man's term. Nasty for, term. Know, yeah, I realized it was really nasty. It was an ugly thing. So I never used the word. Right. Um, it concerns me because we, we still are doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Things well, they're yeah. That's their whole way of doing things is try to yeah. make them seem like they're very, very different from us. So it's okay to kill them. They're not humans. <laughs> yeah. Isn't and that, that's sad, isn't it? Yes. It's just Very so sad. sad. I don't know where That's that why. came from, the idea that it was okay to do that. I have no, I, history doesn't talk about that. You know, I, I don't dealt, know. I dealt with I, veterans for years, uh, working with uh, our Vietnam vets, and so on, trying to help them uh, come through some major crisis. So I don't know where this notion of was killing people came from. It certainly was uh, ancient. The whole thing, the whole yeah. colonization business, yeah, business but, is yeah. just very bad news, mm -hmm. I think. Uh -huh. But that's why I'm trying to revive and bring shamans together and have them travel around and tell us this about thing. Yeah. things, so that I'm a member of a group called Shamanism Without Borders. Yeah, is there a group like that? Yes, and uh, I belong to uh, shaman, shamanic practitioners. Uh, and they started this shaman with autism. They went into a meeting like we did for the people in Puerto Rico, and the people in Texas, and then this business going on in Las Vegas. You know, well, that's... I was talking to a... a a young man yesterday and I was expressing my sorrow and he said the problem is it's becoming commonplace and we're just shrugging our shoulders that doesn't impact us anymore we're getting used to this all the minuscule details down to what color the last root of her hair was or this or that you know overdone so now we've become hardened mm -hmm. we are becoming hardened which is sad Sad, 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 from my perspective anyway, so um, I think that, uh, well, I Well, I, I don't want to romanticize Native Americans or Native uh, First People of, of Canada. They had their problems, they had their bad people, uh, you know, just like any other group of people. They're humans. Mm -hmm. I need to uh, in this show now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure, Julia. It always is when we're chatting. I get carried away with you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And you have a great day. Bye-bye now.